Well, here we are, only November, and it's snowing like crazy. I'm actually behind the hangar right now, uh, protected by the winds. The winds are at about uh, 60 or 70 kilometers an hour. I had to come out to the airport to do something, and I figure I'd film this. Uh, definitely not a flying day. Uh, it's, it's cold, and it's only the beginning of November. Uh, so my plane is definitely not made for this kind of weather. However, I thought, there are planes made for this kind of weather. So in this episode, let's have a look at the kings of winter flying. I hope you enjoy it. So let's get to it. <laughs> So let's begin by stating the obvious. Most, if not all, aircraft can fly in the winter. It's just a matter of what you're comfortable with, combined with the capabilities of your airplane. For instance, you wouldn't fly an ultralight in the middle of winter, would you? Well, you could. And a lot of people do. As a matter of fact, in Quebec, every year around January or February, a bunch of Challenger ultralight aircraft gather together to enjoy the snow and the ice in the winter. Bunch of crazy Canadians. My particular version of winter flying consists of landing at a hard surface runway which is super, super clean and super, super close to a place where I can go get some hot chocolate. Hold the marshmallows, please. Let's assume that your version of winter flying is unlike my version of winter flying where you prefer to land on a remote strip somewhere. And by remote strip, I mean not really a runway, just a bunch of snow on the ground. Uh, or maybe a frozen lake, or a frozen lake with some snow on it. In either case, what you're going to need are some skis. Now the definition of segue is a smooth transition from one topic to the next. That's not what this is going to be. Skis. Let's talk about skis. It was quite difficult to figure out who exactly developed the first airplane ski, but there are a few notables. A 1940s edition of the Canadian magazine Maclean's mentions that the Elliott brothers of Sioux Lookout, Ontario are credited with the development in the late 1920s of special skis for landing on snow or ice. The first credited for creating a retractable airplane ski was Henry Wigley. In the mid-1950s, Henry was flying tourists around Mount Cook when he began to imagine a retractable ski that would allow airplanes to take off and land from an airfield and land on snow. He spent hundreds of hours developing his retractable skis and piloted the first retractable ski plane in September of 1955 with the adventurer Sir Edmund Hillary among his passengers. Let's start with the most recognizable granddaddy of them all, the de Havilland single-engine beaver. This plane was born on August 16, 1947 and believe it or not, was designed around the answers to a questionnaire that was sent to bush plane pilots. The Beaver was produced between 1947 and 1967 and flew at both the North and South Poles. Service in Antarctica was so valuable that a lake, a glacier and an island were named after it. It sported a 450 horsepower WASP radial engine, fly around 140 miles per hour, carry 138 gallons of fuel, and transported nearly one ton of cargo and or passengers. And added bonus, Harrison Ford flies one. So if it's good enough for Han, it's good enough for me. Next up, the Beaver's big sister, the amazing twin otter. I captured these photos and videos at my local airport as fall was approaching. This was either flight testing or pilot checkout for a plane that is most probably already in Antarctica by now. The British Antarctic Survey, whose name can be seen on the side of the otter, according to their website, has the vision of being a world leading center for polar science and polar operation, addressing issues of global importance and helping society adapt to a changing world. So why the twin otter? Well, the twin otters are extremely versatile and can be modified to allow airborne surveying and other scientific equipments to be fitted. The aircraft can be operated single pilot and with a long range fuel tank. Double cargo doors provide good access for installing instrument racks. The version operated by the British Antarctic Survey is a wheel ski equipped aircraft which lands on snow, ice or any other type of hard service runway in any remote area. During a typical season, they will transport people, fuel, skidoo, sledges, food, and scientific equipment to remote camps. Next up, 
this plane, the C-130, aka Hercules. But can this plane land in these conditions? Well, the answer would be a resounding yes, more so if you put some skis on her. Depending on the model, four engines ranging from 4,200 to 4,700 horsepower will pull an airplane of 112 feet in length, 38 feet tall, having a wingspan of 132 feet at speeds of anywhere between 345 and 410 miles per hour. Considering this plane can carry pretty much anything such as helicopters and tanks to a cargo load of up to 42,000 pounds, this is truly a king or queen of winter. This particular model is a Lockheed LC-130, which is a ski-equipped version. The nose ski on this plane is 10 feet long and 5.5 and feet wide. The main skis are 12 feet long. If that isn't cool enough, this plane also comes with Jet Assisted Takeoff, or JADO, to help you get off with a little extra oomph when needed. So the big question, since we focused on Antarctica, have any airliners endured the wintry weather of Antarctica? The answer is yes, they have. Although airliner types have landed in Antarctica for over 60 years, the first commercial airliner, a Boeing 757, landed in Union Glacier in Antarctica on November 26, 2015. Since that moment, more and more have been making the journey. So we've shown you the four planes that can be considered the kings of winter, but none compared to our next contender. Our next contender isn't even a king though, it's an emperor, the Emperor Penguin to be exact. Yes, not an airplane, but this is the original gangster. The Emperor Penguin is about 50 inches long and has a gross weight of up to 100 pounds and can swim, think Arctic float plane, at a super speed of 9 kilometers per hour and capable of diving and staying underwater for approximately 22 minutes. At some point, penguins did fly after all. Guess they found a place to call home. So that's it for this one folks. Make sure you pass the word along and let others know that we're here and don't forget to watch some of our other videos. Hope to see you all next time.